do something you're very passionate about and don't try to chase what is kind of the hot passion of the day. People say you, you have to have a lot of passion for what you're doing and it's totally true and the reason is, uh, is because it's so hard that if you don't, any rational person would give up. It's really hard and you have to do it over a sustained period of time. So if you don't love it, if you're not having fun doing it, you don't really love it, uh, you're gonna give up. So just go and do it, try, learn from it. You, you know, you'll fail at some things. That's a learning experience that you need so that you can take that on to the next experience. Um, and don't let people who you may respect uh, and who you believe know what they're talking about, don't let them tell you it can't be done because often they will tell you it can't be done and uh, it's just because they don't have the courage to try it. I think people that look for great ideas to make money uh, you know, aren't nearly as, as successful as those who say, okay, what do I really love to do? What am I excited about? What do I know something about? You know, what's kind of interesting and compelling? It's uh, very rewarding when you work on something you think is gonna make a big difference. And uh, yeah, it's a little bit harder, but I think, uh, I think the passion that one might bring with it uh, brings so much more energy to that that you're more likely to succeed. You have to have an emotional investment in what you're doing. If you don't love what you're doing, um, failure is pretty much guaranteed. Success is not guaranteed by any means, but failure is m much more likely if you don't love what you're doing. If you know exactly what you wanna be, you need to spend as much time with people that are actually that already. You know, one of the things that I do is I question a lot of things. Um, and you can do that in a good way and a bad way, but hopefully if you try to get people to motivate why they're doing something and their way of thinking, you know, the worst thing you can end up with is a situation where um, you get told, well, this is the way it's always been. Mm -hmm. That's the worst ever. That's a non-answer. Instead, ask yourself, you know, given everything we have today, is there a way we can make this better? And so when we're coming up with ideas, you know, we always ask ourselves, um, what kind of new market is this creating? And then also, what, what part of my day and, and what problem is it solving? And so I've gone as far as taking an entire catalog of my day from the moment I like open my eyes and writing down every single thing I do and then asking myself like, is there something here? If you're not coming up with 10 ideas a day, that's why I have this thing. If I'm not coming up, if I'm not filling up this page every single day, then my idea muscle will atrophy. And I started this in 2001 and I still do it every single day. Like you have to come up with ideas every single day or the idea muscle atrophies. The good news is after about six months of doing that, you're like a machine. Like people get surprised at how many ideas you could just have anywhere. But understand that naturally nobody is interested in your idea. The world could care less and you have to persuade them and you have to show that you're the one person out there that can do it. When it comes to changing the world, what I learned from Steve Jobs is if you believe in a Macintosh, if you believe in iPhone, iPod, iPad, if you believe enough, then you will see it because other people will believe in it. Other people will create software. Other people will create products. So you need to foster the belief in what you are dreaming so that it becomes a reality, which is very different than saying, I don't expect anybody to believe it until I see it. You need people to believe it before they can see it. Don't necessarily think that you have to have the home run and the huge Apple computer on your first start. I spent a long time in my life with skills just building little devices for fun. For fun is one of the key things because that drives you to think and think and think and make it better and better and better than you ever would if you're doing it for a company. Build things at first for yourself that you would want. For somebody aspiring to you know, take things to the next level or to even surpass their wildest dreams, there's always going to have to be an element of luck. But I think more important is putting yourself in a business that can be ubiquitous, that, that, can, that really doesn't have limits because otherwise there's always going to be a grind to it but if, if the business if 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 it can't be something that you can visualize every business using or every consumer using 
it's going to be tough to scale to be big enough or to have the perceived value. You want an idea about what you can say. I know it sounds like a bad idea, but here's specifically why it's actually a great one. You want to sound crazy, but you want to actually be right. Because when you're trying to differentiate, when you're trying to do something different, there's going to be that gut moment, that gut sense. Is this right? Is this not right? If you're not, if you're not having doubt, you're not pushing the boundaries far enough. Don't think about how do I get really, how do I get big fast? That will happen if you actually build something super meaningful and super important. So don't think about, you know, what is the quickest way to success? Think about what is the best way to building something important that the world really needs. This little idea explains why some organizations and some leaders are able to inspire where others aren't. Let me define the terms really quickly. Every single person, every single organization on the planet knows what they do, 100%. Some know how they do it, whether you call it your differentiating value proposition or your proprietary process or your USP. But very, very few people or organizations know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make a profit. That's a result. It's always a result. By why, I mean what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your organization exist? So when we see a kid with a lemonade stand, it's different than when we see a vending machine selling lemonade, even if it's exactly the same product, because the story around it is what people are paying for. So when I meet small business people, all I ask them is not what's their balance sheet, but what's their story. Why should I pick you? Why do I care about what you're doing? And if you start giving me all this inside baseball statistics about why you're 2% better than some other competitor, I'm already glazed over because that's not part of the way I see the world. I have to want this to exist in the world. I have to not, so it's a similar rule, just say, if this was successful and I had nothing and I got no, and I was not involved and I got no money off it or wasn't, would I want it to do well? And that's a great check, I think, to know if you really feel good about the idea and, and can be passionate about it. One of the things I advise entrepreneurs to do is when you have an idea, a classic entrepreneurial impulse is to hold the idea close to you and not go tell people because, oh, the idea is so special. Right. That's almost always a mistake. Hmm. Go talk to Why every, is that a mistake? Yeah. It's a mistake because your actual real competitive advantage is not that you have this idea that you have locked away in your closet, which may or may not be accurate and you have no idea which it is. Uh, your, your actual competitive advantage is if you're assembling the intelligence around does this idea work, what is the right team, mm. what is the right learnings, and we're essentially in motion. The hardest thing to do is start. Um, you have all these ideas and everyone has an idea, but it's really about executing the idea and building the idea and attracting other people to help you work on the idea. That is the biggest challenge. But the, the way to begin is to get the idea out of your head, draw it out, you know, um, talk about it, program it if you're a programmer, or make it if you're building something. Like, you don't have to be the best, but you have to be dangerous, right? You have to learn just enough to be dangerous to build an idea, concept it, and show it to the world. And then it turns out there are lots of other people, including all 170 employees that work at Instagram, who are much better at doing all that stuff than I am. But you need to find people who can, you know, be drawn to the idea that you build, and, and then they end up taking it and, um, and making it even better. You know, one way to conceptualize what makes a good product is, you know, good engineering is part of it, good design is part of it, but really it's, um, one way I think about it is at least, is uh, maximizing the probability that someone shows up at the front door of, you know, your store or your website or, or whatever it is and, and ends up with a solved problem. And oftentimes the best methodology is to start with the perfect experience of just one person get that right, and then figure out how to scale something great instead of scaling something not so great and then trying to improve it. That's really hard to do. Uh, and so I think when you are starting a new business, you, uh, you don't want to go after giant markets. You want to go after small markets, and you want to take over those markets quickly. Constantly seek criticism. Yeah. Uh, a a well-thought-out a well critique of whatever you're doing is as valuable as gold. Um, and you should seek that from everyone you can, but particularly your friends. If you're not utilizing an online community, then you're at a disadvantage to those who are. You can be asking online communities what they think about your ideas, or if they have any advice with what you're working on. Not only will you hear from people who are passionate about the subject, but you'll be hearing from people all around the world, each with their own experiences and stories that can help you. 
And there are a lot of people from whom we can learn a lot. And I think like, you know, the one piece of advice is like, don't underestimate anyone you come across. Ever. Right. Like whether they're, you know, uh, you know a, a blue collar worker waiting for the bus or they're, you know, helping you at your, they're the server or bartender at the restaurant or they're a lower ranking employee. I mean, the smartest leaders I've ever seen have always gone around the room and asked for everybody's opinion. Most startups that fail do it ultimately because they did not make something that people wanted. They made something that, um, you know, that they thought people would want, um, but they were either in denial about it, about, you know, whether it was actually any good, um, or somebody else came along and made something that people wanted even more. <laughs> the best piece of advice that, that we've figured out as we've been doing Courseware is not to, not to let other people distract what you're doing. There's always haters that say, your idea is stupid, this idea is never gonna work, um, don't even bother doing that because someone else is gonna do it before you do. And if we listened to all those, all that feedback that we were getting, all that negative feedback, we would never have built things, we would never have prototyped things. And that's how we really got to where we are. Like we saw things that we wanted to build, and we just went out and built them. And it turns out when you build stuff that you like to use, um, there's a good chance that there's thousands of other people that want to use it too. And so it's not just about doing focus groups, it's not just about you know, double checking your vision, it really is about integrating this concept of testing our ideas rigorously throughout the product development process, throughout the marketing process, even as we scale up. But what you really need to do is think about what is the smallest possible test that I can run for this idea, for this concept, for this theory, get it out there, and get customers using it. Because your customers are going to be the ones to tell you if it's really working or not. Like, like there's almost this expectation that you have to have in your mind this, this sort of, I'm going to change the world sort of make a dent in the universe kind of kind of ambition, right? But it's actually okay early on to just kind of solve small problems in layers until you actually get to a point where you have the capacity to do that. What this all comes down to is doing something exceptional for your users, whether it's in community, whether it's in connection, or whether it's in design. This is our big advantage as a startup, is that we can actually get away with doing this. We can make this the core part of why we're doing business. I think you should be spending your money on, on, um, on teaching and, and sharing. And so that might mean hiring a writer or two, perhaps, instead of a marketing person. You know, and start writing and start getting people to listen to what you're saying. You can't talk about yourself all the time because no one's going to come back for that. But you have to talk about things that are relevant to your industry or ideas that you have and start to build that audience up. I do think that one thing that's important is, especially if you're a founder or a technical founder, is to realize that you can't do everything, and even if you can, you shouldn't. You should find a great partner, no matter what it is that you're doing, um, and you should look for someone who is very high intelligence, uh, very high energy, and very high integrity. And you need all three of those, and you can't compromise on any one of them. Otherwise, you'll end up with uh, either someone who's not smart, which is, does you no good, or someone who's not hardworking, which also does you no good, or the worst case is you end up with a smart, hardworking crook who ends up working against your interests. And uh, integrity is something that takes a lot of time spent with someone to figure out. The most important thing when you're working with people early is that you guys line up on, on what your goals are. Um, that's, that's really, that sounds really basic, but you can totally, it can be fine. You can want to build a small business um, that makes money and you don't have to go to an office every day. Or you can want to build a huge company. You can want to build Google. But I think you have to be really, really aligned on that. When you know, a lot of corporations have, they might call them core values or guiding principles or so on. But the problem is usually they're very lofty sounding. They kind of read like a press release the marketing department put out. Uh, they sound just like their competitors. And maybe you learn about it on day one of your job. But then it becomes this meaningless plaque on the lobby wall. Well, we wanted to come up with committable core values. And by committable, meaning we're willing to hire or fire people based on those values, uh, completely independent of their actual job performance. The definition of values is they're the behaviors or principles that you religiously adhere to within your company. When I say religious, I mean that no amount of data will sway you in, from, from, um, from those principles. And the degree to which that you have the courage to um, maintain your conviction around those ideas is the degree to which you're going to be successful over the long term. A company is simply a group of people um, and uh, as a leader of people uh, you have to be a great listener, um, you have to be a great motivator, uh, you have to uh, be very good at praising and looking for the best in people 
Um, you know, people are no different from, from flowers. If you water flowers, they flourish. If you um, praise people, they flourish. And, um, and that's a critical attribute of, um, of a leader. Um, so I kind of like half jokingly with, with a lot of people say that, you know, my job is basically like to be, to be the assistant for the rest of the company. Like my job is to, to make sure that like you have what you need um, that it's and, and basically you have everything you need to kick ass like that's my job if you don't have that then let me know because I'm not doing my job you know there are a lot of things that are outside of your control uh, a lot of external circumstances will depend like determine the success of your idea whether you know the market timing is right for this new kind of service um, or whether uh, people you know whether a customer like the economy is right for, for for your kind of service right whether um, you meet the right people who will finance your company um, all, many, many external circumstances are like outside of your control and like, but will affect the outcome and you, know, you have to like be okay with that. Another quality that I think is important is kind of being flexible minded or open minded. I'm not saying you shouldn't have a you know, vision for, for your idea or your product, but you need to be open to changes. So many things go wrong when you're starting a company, and often I think people ask, you know, what mistakes uh, should you avoid making? And, you know, my answer to that question is don't even bother trying to avoid mistakes because you're going to make tons of mistakes, right? And the, the, um, the important thing is actually learning quickly from whatever mistakes you make and not giving up. Right, and I mean, there, there are things every single year of Facebook's existence that could have killed us or made it so that it, it just seemed like moving forward and making a lot of progress just seemed intractable, but you just kind of bounce back and you learn, and um, nothing is impossible. You just have to kind of keep running through the walls. The two things we really zero in on on people are, um, you know, two things. They sound simple, they end up being very difficult. Um, courage and genius. Um, courage is the one we talk about a lot because it's the one that people can learn. Um, you, know, you know, courage, courage, which is to say, not giving up in the face of adversity. Um, you know, just being absolutely determined to succeed. You know, is something that you can you can like force yourself to do. It can be very painful. You can force yourself to do it. The genius part is a little bit hard to force yourself to do. Um, you know, courage without genius might not get you where you need to go, but genius without courage almost certainly won't. And I think the reality uh, is just you know not quite so glamorous. There's sort of a, there's an ugly side to uh, being an entrepreneur, uh, and also just more importantly, uh, what what you're actually spending your time on is, is just a lot of hard work. Uh, Sam mentioned this, but you're basically just <laughs> sitting at your desk, heads down, focused, um, answering customers, customer support emails, doing sales, figuring out hard engineering problems. Um, so it's really important that you kind of like go in with, with eyes wide open. Optimism has a place, but I think even more so for the first time entrepreneur, it, you need to be pragmatically pessimistic. What I mean by that is you need to define all of the worst case scenarios in terms of financial loss, time loss, etc. Look at what you will learn if that happens and accept and come to terms with that before you ever start. If you don't do that and you go straight into battling the world, trying to conquer the world with rose-colored glasses on, the first time you hit a major hiccup, you're gonna become really demoralized and you will quit. If you don't love it, you won't make it through the long period of pain that is inevitable. So. Uh, make sure that you take care of yourself during the process. Make sure that you take care of uh, your mental health, your physical health while you're doing it because it's a long road. 